Um, let me know if I go too fast, too slow and stuff. Um, but yeah. Okay, so my relationship to borders is deeply personal, but connected to communities and spaces. I think a lot of the time, if you're a citizen and you're black and brown and you live in the no in you live in the northern sort of hemisphere of the world, you know that your citizenship is just it, it can be taken away in some sense. Like just look at the case of Shamima Begum, for instance. Whether you kind of agree or disagree with kind of what happened, the way her citizenship was taken away is something that has something to do with her colour. All of a sudden she's Bangladesh, even though she has no citizenship there. And and the way they've just kind of connected it is something we should all be scared of, to be honest. It's the kind of slippery slope of citizenship if you're black and brown. Um, so my family come from Nigeria. My grandparents came here in the 1950s, coming out around a time when, you know, Britain was scared of this kind of growing spread of communism in kind of the Southern Hemisphere, specifically in Africa. And there was a lot of decolonization movement. So they allowed a lot of students to come here, thinking that the students would, you know, learn some stuff and kind of bring capitalism back to the kind of South of the world. And my dad kind of came here in the sort of mass migration of um the 1980s um so my family's history has always been intertwined with colonial borders and the artificial creation of africa and specifically nigeria and sierra leone um so there's definitely a recognition that i've always had that without this kind of burgundy or now blue passport um my rights and citizenship can are kind of um can be taken away or just feel that and i felt it was very apparent when i lived abroad so um when I lived in Malaysia, for instance, the way I was treated compared to like my fellow white Brits was sort of like, oh, like you're British too. Like, and there was this kind of sense of having to justify that I am black, but also British. And then if I, for instance, hung out with um, like black Africans in Asia, there was a sort of sense of hostility of why are you here? What are these people here for? What do you want? Are you really a student? Um, and you see that with the way visas are kind of created within the world. Um, and our freedom that we have being from the North or having um, a British passport and how much freedom you have um, when you have a passport like that. So I guess it's the difference between being an expat or being an immigrant. Um, so just to emphasize, borders are a system of power and they go beyond the demarcation of arbitrary lines on territory, but symbolize a politics of imperialism and powers deeply embedded in forms of racism. Um, so you kind of see that with a lot of the conversations when it comes to like different refugee crises, as though someone would cross the lines across the world and, and leave where they kind of, you know, grew up just for the sake of it. They're refugees. <laughs> like they don't just, people don't leave their homeland for the sake of it. Um, so yeah. And I think when I kind of worked kind of with the UN, um, in, I used to work for the UNHCR and you've become very aware of this kind of sense of like um i don't know how arbitrary the whole system is really and how much borders are such an arbitrary thing we do and how much a passport or a visa all these types of things allow you to navigate or not allow you not to navigate life um and when it comes to borders borders have always been something that we've put on the global south so it's been a way of kind of um, exploiting the global south and saying, you know, these these people, these black and brown people can go here, um, can't go here, and, but certain other people can. But um, in a post kind of 9-11 world, kind of what Shan talked about, we see actually this notion of borders being created or being more um, violent within the global, global north too. Um, so um, in a post 9-11 world, we have this kind of heightened sense of politics, the heightened politics of fear after the sort of terrorist attacks that have led to the kind of militarization of Western borders too. So it's always been something that we kind of have seen in the global South, but actually we see that same sort of movement and lack of movement and not allowing people to move based on this idea of politics of fear. And now we also see it in the kind of conversations we see in climate change too, and I'll touch on that. If there's time but you see it with like right wing the right wing rhetoric um taken up taking the climate change movement as a way to kind of stop people um from moving places with the conversations around population growth 
but these conversations are only really about people moving around in the global south or people from the global south trying to come to the global north so just to emphasize borders are violent um and the kind of violence we see at borders are systems of violence itself so when we think of borders or a lot of the borders where we see a lot of violence like for instance in america with families in cages or you know the many people who died in um a, along the mediterranean coming from you know north africa to um europe we know that these deaths are actually preventable there's absolutely no need for the kind of deaths and the kind of tragic ways we've seen people die but they are the system they are a um they are a symptom of the notion of borders themselves and we see them even when we think of like the borders that were created in a post-colonial world india becoming this kind of imperial pa a power for, for south asia and the fact that since the since kind of um the um since the since the creation of india itself that border has always been a hostile place and the occupation of kashmir um, so, you know, it's just the idea that we wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't have illegal immigration if we didn't have laws around this, because there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting to move around the globe. And like I said, it's the idea of, you know, what is an expat and what is an immigrant and what makes you that different. Um, so, you know, I advocate and I truly believe in this kind of notion of like the freedom to stay, the freedom to move and the freedom to return. Um, and it's a book I read from Hasha Walia, and a lot of people kind of talk about this. So the freedom to stay is about actively fighting against the things that displace people, war, poverty, capitalism, state violence, these types of things. The freedom to move is obviously talking about, well, if you know stuff is happening, let people move around, let people be able to kind of save themselves, don't leave them to just die. If there's state violence happening, if there's wars happening, if there's famine happening, and the freedom ret return is about creating an environment where people can return and people can live where they want to go. Because like we said, people only move if they need to, if they have to. Um, people aren't just moving for the sake of it. There's always this notion of like all these economic migrants trying to move places. Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't need to move if they didn't have to. Um, so yeah, the aftermath of terrorism, uh, terrorism, we've seen the sort of militarization of borders seep into the kind of domestic sphere that we only thought would be in the global south we've seen it with trump and blm and we're seeing it now in the uk with even the powers that are created with this new crime bill um the us went around the world kind of perfecting the domestic the their domestic militarization you know with the occupation of the philippines hawaii and the uk did it for hundreds of years through empire building but the same way we see kind of police and prisons, and they always have these places in our mind, is the same way we see borders. It's the thing we, we can't see without. We can't think of a world without polices, prisons, and borders. But all these concepts are racist, they are anti-Black, and they're structures that don't like serve anyone. So it was only the other day that I kind of found out that the word mobility derives from the word mob. And mob is used as a word to mainly describe poor young men. So prisons and borders fundamentally share the same idea of criminalizing mobs. Imperialism being about imperialism being about a way to colonize and violate countries um, that they can occupy. Um, so we never really talk about borders when we're talking about people going on holiday, but we need to remind us. Itself, that the state itself is illegal but people moving around it never has been and if i can i know i'm kind of running out of time i'll just quickly try and touch on the sort of climate change climate change point um but in the past couple of years climate change the climate change movement and the displacement of, pe of people has kind of um outplayed outpaced itself when it comes to um being a displacing people um but climate disasters are very much informed and intertwined with the politics of imperialism, racism, um, um, power and legacy. Just think of, for instance, uh, coastal countries like Bangladesh and the over extraction, oh, <laughs> the over extraction and industrial forms of um, development with sweatshops that essentially have created the epicenter of creating kind of toxic pollution across the world. 
Um, and really and truly, I guess my main point here is within the climate change conversation, we have to remember, I put time on for myself, within the climate change conversation, we have to remember that um, not to kind of have this growing mantra of kind of eco-fascism and green nationalism, because they justify this notion of white supremacy. And actually we, um, whether you are from the North or the South, um, when it comes to kind of the climate change movement, we're all kind of um, responsible. And I'll just leave it there, but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>